Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself firstly. My name is Alice McDavid, and I am the head of UK training at DOS Training. Um, I wanted to thank you for joining our webinar this morning that Tanya is very kindly hosting for us. Um, but before I go on to introduce Tanya and the topic that she will be covering, I just wanted to cover a bit of um, kind of tech issues. I don't know if people are familiar with GoToWebinar and how it works, but because of the um, number of people that we have on the webinar, it puts everybody on mute. So um, if anybody has any questions throughout the webinar for Tanya, if you just raise your hand, there's like a, a hand raising like emoji. If you just click that, then I'll be able to see who's got a question and I'll turn you off mute and you can ask your question. Um, alternatively, you can write in the chat function. So if you don't want to speak, then please just write your question in the chat function and I will then ask Tanya your question for you anonymously or not, it's completely up to you. Um, so I believe that's all the tech. The webinar will last about 50 minutes and then we'll have maybe 10 minutes at the end for any questions that have accumulated during the webinar. And um, the slides will not be available just for copyright reasons at the end of this, but we will be sending out some follow up information on uh, whether or not you want an extended training on this, more information on either the topics or anything that Tanya has covered. And um, yeah, if you have any other questions that you think of after the webinar, then do get in touch. We are here to answer them. So that is the kind of tech bit and boring information over and done with. Um, so there you go. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to now introduce Tanya. Tanya is an associate of DOS training. So what that means is that we use Tanya to deliver training for us on a variety of topics that um, are specialist to her. Um, two of those we are covering today, so the innovation and sustainability webinar, um, kind of Tanya's like bread and butter areas. So um, she is, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this, and it will become very apparent in the next 50 minutes, but very clued up on this area um, and has delivered a lot of work across a variety of um, different organizations, which I'm sure she'll go into a bit more detail in a moment as well. So um, yeah, if there's no questions for right now or anybody has um, anything they'd like to ask, then do raise your hand. Hopefully you can hear us okay. Um, but I am now going to um, pass over to Tanya. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Alice. Wonderful. So if we can just start from slide one at the beginning. Wonderful. So great to meet you all, everybody. And as Alice said, I'm going to be talking to you about innovation and sustainability. So everywhere I go, people are telling me from corporates to government to development agencies, they are in uncharted territory and they need new ideas, new approaches to develop new products, services. Um, and this is where the innovation piece comes in. They're also telling me they need new ways to drive environmental and social impact, which is focused on sustainability. So whichever camp you're in, some of you will be focused on both topics. I'm going to talk you through a few tools and techniques that I have used globally um, to produce successful programs. So next slide, please, Alice, let's begin. So just briefly, as an introduction, as Alice said, I have worked globally in academia and at Royal Holloway University, the University of Chicago. I've also worked in the UN across Asia and Europe. So in terms of innovation, I designed the innovation strategy up at UN headquarters and implemented this across Asia, where I worked with expert teams to really drive change, develop new innovations across energy efficiency, women's economic impact um, and uh, anti-corruption. So I've worked a range of different um, sectors, a range of different geographies and demographics to really develop innovations, which many of them have been award winning. So that's me. So next slide, please, Alice. So I'm going to talk you through today the innovation techniques and tools that I've used across a range of sectors and organisations. So firstly, I'm going to start with the innovation project cycle. How is that different to the traditional cycle and what we're doing now? I'm then going to move on to exploring the challenge. How do we start? Where do we begin? Um, uh, thirdly, how do we uh, generate ideas? Often people say to me, yes, we know how to brainstorm, but really, how do we generate new ideas? 
The fourth stage I'm going to focus on is the testing, the prototyping. Often organizations don't do this at all. And then the final stage is successful implementation and scaling. So if there are no further questions, I'm going to begin. Next slide, please, Alice. So the innovation project cycle. Next slide, thank you. So what's the old way and what's the new way? The old way or the traditional way is that people start with a solution. They start within their teams and they come up with the idea and no real research, no consultation or exposure with, uh, to stakeholders. And what I'm suggesting is the innovation way we start with the challenge. It's a much more vulnerable place to start, but we are saying, what, are, what is the root cause of the issue that we're looking at? Let's do some research. Let's actually frame and understand this challenge. Um, and we don't know what the end result will be, but let's go on a journey with our stakeholders, with our end users to design this new solution, design this new product or service. Again, if we move to the second step on the pilot, people tend to have long pilots, pilots being started from six months to a year where they're plugging a huge amount of resources and time into areas, into solutions, which they have no idea whether they work and they haven't been tested. In the innovation way we test, we prototype very early on with our stakeholders, with our communities, and I'm going to talk more about that later on. Thirdly, people tend to use the same old stakeholders, the same old consultants they bring in to help them develop programs. The same people are gonna produce similar results. What I'm uh, talking about within innovation is to broaden your network, to focus on a range of entrepreneurs, think tanks, innovators, local end users. People tend to consult the end users, maybe at the end, maybe in the beginning, and it's a consultation. I'm suggesting that you bring them in from the beginning and you design closely with them to help shape and develop the idea. And lastly, and I think this is a big one, people often design their solution, develop their program and talk about it at the end. I've seen great success where people begin to talk about, the, talk about it at the beginning. Of course, some facts will be confidential, but often when you talk about things, you know, uh, you tweet about things, people step up to say, oh, I'm doing something similar, or I'm happy to collaborate to work with you to improve your solution. And I've seen great success there. So bearing that in mind, let's go to the next slide. Thank you, Alice. Um, I would like you as a group to put the order in terms of what we just learned, the seven steps, put them in order of the innovation cycle. How do you think the innovation start, cycle starts from beginning to end? You've got a minute to do that. And as soon as you finish, if you could write that in the chat, so we can see who gets there first. Go. And Alice, please feel free to be a part of it as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tanya. So I am keeping an eye on the chat. So um, when anybody has any ideas, right or wrong, uh, then do you pop them in there. Perfect, thank you. So um, Daniel has said examine and challenge. Okay. Anyone else have any ideas? Yeah, you've got about 15 seconds left to write it in the chat. <laughs> Um, Sonal said generate ideas first. Okay. And stop. So we've got two people who have who've answered. Is there anybody who's got all seven steps that they think in the right order? Also feel free to put your hand up if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to chat. Okay. Yep. And I will turn you off mute if anybody. Um, okay, we're getting them three now. So somebody, Sophie said, examine the challenge, generate ideas, design and test, make the case, implementation, change the system, grow, spread and scale. And then, um, oh, so Daniel just come back and said, seven, six, four, five, two, three, one, which would be examine grow the challenge. and spread. Yeah. Um, then we have examine the challenge, generate ideas, make the case, design and test, change the system, implementation, grow, spread and scale. And that's from Pete. Um, Let's have one more if it's just there. So 
So the others have just come back and said, um, <laughs> Aaron said what Pete said. <laughs> <laughs> Easiest way. Okay. Well, the winner is Sophie. And I've never heard somebody get it completely oh, in, in the right order so quickly. So congratulations, Sophie. So if we could go to the next slide, the big reveal, I'll talk you through it and I'll show you the order. Brilliant. Thank you, Alice. So we start off with examining the challenge. As we said, we start off with the root cause of the problem, trying to frame the issue we're looking at. The next stage, we begin to generate ideas. So that's the brainstorm I'm going to take you through. The third stage is one of the most crucial stages that most organisations miss out. After we come up with the idea, we're going to design and test it so that we get feedback. We do it iteratively. So we come in, we're tweaking our products, tweaking our solutions. Then we begin to make the case. That's the financial case as well as the product and solution case. We then begin on implementation. I'm going to talk you through the scaling as we do that through stages. And then at the end of scaling, we've changed the system. So that's the innovation project cycle. Well done, Sophie. Okay, let's move on to the next step. Thank you, Alice. So uh, next slide, thank you. So exploring the challenge. Be in the next step. Next slide, thank you, Alice. Brilliant, thank you. So in terms of exploring the challenge, innovation often starts with a fresh insight, a new perspective that leads you to produce a completely different solution. But the only way to get there, at least the way I've worked with a range of people across the world, is really starting to ask fresh questions, new questions to produce a different perspective. Next slide, please, Alice. We need to frame the challenge. Often we think we've understood the problem and we haven't got to the root cause of the problem. And as a result of that, we design services that do not meet the needs of the target group. Often we haven't even included the target group or we've lightly done a light touch consultation. And that means we've missed um, the kind of root cause of the problem. We haven't understood the problem and we ended up designing something that doesn't meet the needs. We need to start framing the challenge and asking the right questions. Let me show you a case study. Next slide, please, Alice. 20 million babies are born prematurely worldwide. In developing countries, 4 million of these babies die because of hypothermia. Next slide, please, Alice. Uh, next step, first step. Brilliant, leave it there, thank you. Um, so in Stanford, there was a team who wanted to focus on, on this issue, on the issue of um, premature babies, and they wanted to understand how they could design better incubators, particularly focusing on developing countries. So they went into the field, they spoke to a range of doctors, social workers, this is the research stage, they began to examine the challenge to try to understand the root cause. They spoke to mothers, um, and after gathering the feedback, they realised that they had the wrong question. They had the wrong challenge. They hadn't framed it correctly. Next stage, please, Alice. They realized they needed to talk about how they keep the baby warm. So they'd reframe the question from how do we provide a better incubator to how do we keep the baby warm? They also realized in their consultation with the stakeholders at the very beginning was that there were two key issues they needed to focus on. Next stage, please, Alice. The two key issues being affordability, how can they get, and accessibility for the mothers in developing countries. After a series of brainstorming, after they applied a series of, they went through the innovation process, they came up with this final new solution, which was, next stage please, Alice, a miniature incubator. If we go one stage, you'll see a picture of the incubator, of the picture of the sleeping bag, apologies. So they went from, how do we create a better incubator? by going through the innovation process, asking a series of questions, reframing the challenge and gathering feedback from a range of stakeholders on the ground, they came up with a completely different solution, which is the miniature sleeping bag. I'm gonna show you a short video to describe this process now. Next stage, please, Alice. Please close your eyes and open your hands. Now imagine what you could place in your hands. An apple, maybe your wallet, 
Now open your eyes. What about a life? What you see here is a premature baby. He looks like he's resting peacefully, but in fact, he's struggling to stay alive because he can't regulate his own body temperature. This baby is so tiny, he doesn't have enough fat on his body to stay warm. Sadly, 20 million babies like this are born every year around the world. Four million of these babies die annually. But the bigger problem is that the ones who do survive grow up with severe long-term health problems. The reason is because in the first month of a baby's life, its only job is to grow. If it's battling hypothermia, organs can't develop normally, resulting in a range of health problems from diabetes to heart disease to low IQ. Imagine, many of these problems could be prevented if these babies were just kept warm. That is the primary function of an incubator. But traditional incubators require electricity and cost up to $20,000. So you're not gonna find them in rural areas of developing countries. As a result, parents resort to local solutions like tying hot water bottles around their baby's bodies or placing them under light bulbs like the ones you see here, methods that are both ineffective and unsafe. I've seen this firsthand over and over again. On one of my first trips to India, I met this young woman, Savita, who had just given birth to a tiny premature baby, Rani. She took her baby to the nearest village clinic and the doctor advised her to take Rani to a city hospital so she could be placed in an incubator. But that hospital was over four hours away and Savita didn't have the means to get there. So her baby died. Inspired by this story and dozens of other similar stories like this, my team and I realized what was needed was a local solution, something that could work without electricity, that was simple enough for a mother or a midwife to use, given that the majority of births still take place in the home. We needed something that was portable, something that could be sterilized and reused across multiple babies, and something ultra low cost compared to the $20,000 that an incubator in the US costs. So this is what we came up with. What you see here looks nothing like an incubator. It looks like a small sleeping bag for a baby. You can open it up completely. It's waterproof. There's no seams inside, so you can sterilize it very easily. But the magic is in this pouch of wax. This is a phase change material. It's a wax-like substance with a melting point of human body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. You can melt this simply using hot water. And then when it melts, it's able to maintain one constant temperature for four to six hours at a time, after which you simply reheat the pouch. So you then place it into this little pocket back here. And it creates a warm micro environment for the baby. Looks simple, but we've reiterated this dozens of times by going into the field to doctors, moms, and clinicians to ensure that this really meets the needs of the local communities. We plan to launch this product in India in 2010, uh, and the target price point will be $25, less than 0.1% of the cost of a traditional incubator. Over the next five years, we hope to save the lives of almost a million babies, but the longer-term social impact is a reduction in population growth this seems counterintuitive, but it turns out that as infant mortality is reduced, population sizes also decrease because parents don't need to anticipate that their babies are going to die. We hope that the Embrace Infant Warmer and other simple innovations like this represent a new trend for the future of technology. Simple, localized, affordable solutions that have the potential to make huge social impact. In designing this, we followed a few basic principles. We really try to understand the end user, in this case, people like Savita. We try to understand the root of the problem rather than being biased by what already exists. And then we thought of the most simple solution we could to, to address this problem. In doing this, I believe we can truly bring technology to the masses and we can save millions of lives through the simple warmth of an embrace. Thank you for that, Alice. Obviously, there are a few slides. Oh, if you could stop that, thank you. Move to the next slide, thank you. Obviously, there are a few tech issues there, but I think you got the gist of what she was saying. And that's a very simple way that we've used innovation to drive social impact. And that particular innovation has had huge amounts of success. So I'm going to pause there to see if anybody's got any questions before we move on to the third end stage, which is generating project ideas. OK, if there are no questions, I'm going to move on. OK, next slide, please, Alice. 
so with generating ideas, people often say to me, look, we have had brainstorming sessions in our teams, but they're not very successful and we need some guidance. So I'm going to share a few tips and, and methodologies that uh, I've used and worked with expert teams to help us devise this. Thank you, Alice. So uh, double uh, Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling says the best way uh, to come up with great ideas, to have as many big ideas as possible and then to shift, sift out the bad ones. Um, this is really key. Often people are sitting on their hands with ideas and they never share them often because they think they're silly or they're not going to work. In the first um, stage of the brainstorming within a session, you have to make sure there's no self editing and people share as much as possible. Next slide, please, Alice. So this is one uh, technique, bearing in mind, I should say this program is based on a program that I run across kind of a day to two to three days. So I'm just sharing a few techniques. This is one a tool that we use that we've been very successful. So just to explain, if I start, what's the normal rule? If we look at uh, the approach in version one, the normal rule, doctors treat patients. So if we invert this and apply a kind of innovative social design approach, we would suggest that what if patients were to become the doctors? Now we know there's a range of innovations that have spun out across this, just empowering patients to do their own diagnosis, and be it, you know, it's app that tests their own diabetes and um, levels, or if it's patient doctor, that digital platform where patients focus on minor ailments and they post their own issues and other patients provide support and advice of how to treat them. There's a range of innovations that have spun out using that same kind of practice. Similarly, if we go down I think five steps to addition, if you think about supermarkets, supermarkets now offer a range of things, um, including groceries, you can get petrol, you can go to an optician, you can have dry cleaners. So we use a series of these approaches and we apply them to the issue, the challenge that you're focusing on. And we use this uh, approach and several approaches to help generate and develop new ideas. Next slide, please, Alice. Once we've finished all the brainstorming and we've come up with as many ideas as possible, we then use this tool and we, we work through several questions to help us sift out some of the um, kind of uh, not so good ideas to get to some of the best ideas that we have as a team. And um, some of these questions we don't ask ourselves enough of, you know, we come up with great ideas and we assume this is a solution that people want. And we won't know that until we move on to the next stage, which is to test. But these are basic ideas that we ask ourselves before we move on to the testing phase. So next slide, please, Alice. The testing phase, prototyping, I can't stress this enough. I've been to many organizations where they just don't do this at all. And they certainly don't do this over a short period of time. So I'm gonna run you through um, just what prototyping is and provide you with a case study here. Next slide, please, Alice. So prototyping, early stage testing, producing a minimum viable product, a very basic version of your solution, your product and service, and taking it out to test within the real world. Test with the end users, test with a range of stakeholders, gather their feedback so you can tweak your product or service. And as they said, you know, with the miniature sleeping bag, take it through a range of iterations until you tweak your solution to, you know, it's good enough to be able to implement. So in that picture, that is a mock-up, obviously, of an app, a very a basic mock-up. If we move to the next slide, I'll take you through the case study. So UN Blasislava, they wanted to work with their local community, local disability groups to help them with their mobility issues around town. So they started off, if we move to the next slide, thank you. They started off here. In that picture, there are UN officials, directors, and there are also local communities. So stressing that we start with a conversation with the local community to understand their issues, understand their challenges they have in getting around town. That's where we're talking about exploring the challenge. We then move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, in the left hand side, you're obviously seeing um, uh, the end user member of the community with a wheelchair, who's in a wheelchair. You've also got talking to UN staff, talking about the issues he has moving around town. That's the left hand picture. Who's in the right hand picture? If you can just briefly write in chat, who do you think is that in the right hand picture? Any answers coming in, Alice? Um, so somebody said, Pete said one of the UN people. Spot on this time, Pete. That's absolutely right. Because, what, sorry, Alice? Okay, Linda said UN staff as well. 
exactly these are un directors because the disability groups that the, the community came and said we want you to experience what we experience we can tell you how bad it is to get around town using a wheelchair we can tell you how difficult our mobility issues are but we want you to feel it and so they got the un directors involved and they came out and about into town with the community groups and they got into the wheelchairs themselves to build empathy it's one of the biggest things your target users will say you don't understand our need you know this is not working for us and we're trying to explain it to you and one of the best ways is for you to work closely with your community to understand their issues next slide please alice Everybody then comes back to the room, comes back to the design lab, if you like, and that is the brainstorming session. That's the Generating Isaiah session. That's the stage they're just putting everything out there, no self-editing, and trying to come up with ideas that would be feasible and work for the local community. And the lo local community is involved in the brainstorming as well. Next slide, please, Alex. This is what they came up with. This is a prototype of an app an app that helps the end user, the community, people in disability groups plan their best route around town um, to help them avoid some of the issues, some of the, to help them make it more um, easier for them to move around town more smoothly, more easier, more cheaper for them as well. Next slide, please, Alice. So this is the crux of prototyping, why we would prototype. Often, as we said, as said at the very beginning, in the traditional way, we have a pilot, we have a basic idea of an idea that we then begin to pilot. If you prototype and you fail early, if you see in the graph, you've wasted a little bit of time and a little bit of money. Often we devise programs, we go on to implement programs and we realize halfway through or even at the end of the program that it hasn't worked and we've wasted a huge amount of time and a huge amount of resources. So prototyping not only helps you with gathering feedback from your end users, involving your end users from the very beginning, a simple process to be able to do that. It also helps you save time and money. And so let's just uh, take a quick look um, at what some of the participants said who were involved in the prototyping design sessions. Next slide, please, Alice. So prototype is new to me. The key bit really for me is the in the end sentence. This is very useful and helps us reduce waste of resources. Next slide, please, Alice. The top sentence is key. What we think people need is not necessarily the same as what we really need. This always happens when we begin to prototype. We come up with ideas, you take them out into the field and you have feedback which is very different to what you thought would happen. They always, without fail, challenge your ideas, challenge your notions of what solutions are really going to work. It's a fantastic way of improving your chances of success. Next slide, please, Alice. So before we go on to the final stage, I'm going to pause to see if you have any questions um, regarding prototyping or any of the stages before that. Um, yeah, Tanya, we've got a question from Laura that says, do end users typically get paid for the work they're participating in in the design process? I mean, that depends. It's all up to you. Usually what we have with end users. So if you have a partner, a stakeholder, a community group, for example, and they, I don't know, this community group meet regularly on a basis, on, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, you can then go in and showcase your products or your service or your program and work with them. So you can kind of integrate into their own program. So in that case, you wouldn't necessarily need to pay them. However, if you're holding a focus group or a kind of market research group, then yes, then people do get paid. So it depends on what sector you're in. It depends on um, the way in which you're choosing to work with people. But if you are um, gathering their time, you would give them something. It may not necessarily be monetary, but you 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 would give them something. If you're if you know if they're coming in to see you to a specific kind of consultation group or a workshop. But if you are going into you know a kind of already made group, then maybe you're just a guest at a kind of weekly meeting or a monthly meeting. Thank you, Tanya. And um, Sanal says that they're actually working on a prototype project at the moment, so finding this very helpful. So thank you. Um, Joanne actually has her hand raised. I don't know if that's if you've got a question, Joanne, but I'm going to unmute you if you do, um, and then you should be able to chat. If you don't, then feel free to just ignore me, <laughs> or, and I will lower your hand. Um, do you, Do you have a question, Joanne? 
No, I don't think so. I actually have it in the chat as in should prototyping be costed? Should it co should it be costed? Do you mean like should you put a budget before you begin prototyping? Yes. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, as a program, it should be costed. But what we're really looking at is, as you can see, that basic prototype on something very simple. So if you were prototyping an app, there are um, kind of digital free um, programs online that you can put together your app. I mean, when I prototype with Roots in a face-to-face -face workshop, we literally have recycling materials. You know, it's, it's really supposed to be a very minimum viable product. So if you are prototyping a website, for example, well, you can mock that up for free. So yes, you should cost it. But the point of it is that it's supposed to be very, very cheap. It should not be expensive at all. And obviously, let's, you know, add a caveat in there. If you are, you know, this doesn't apply to all um, sectors, for example, the pharma sector, if you're testing a new medical drug, of course, they, you know, they use, it's going to be expensive. And, and, and you know, you're going to, their trials cost a lot of money. But what we're talking about here is, product solutions that you can make very quickly and test so it shouldn't be that much money but by all means cost it um thank you tanya that's all the questions for right now wonderful thank you okay so let's move on to the final stage the fifth and final stage which is implementation scaling next slide thank you perfect um so the big two things in scaling up is that people once they have their pilot or their prototype they get really excited it's worked and then they go straight to scaling up. You know, I'm gonna go from zero to a hundred to a thousand. And the key thing is, yes, your pilot and prototype has work, worked, but don't forget to keep learning. Don't forget to keep seeking that feedback and scaling up in stages. So you start with the scale one, you have your engagement, innovation, you have your pilot. Then you move to the learning phase. Now, often monitoring evaluation for many projects and organizations is just a tick box exercise. You know, they produce and um, they write some feedback and it sits, goes into a report that sits on the shelf that nobody ever reads. I'm asking that your learning phase is iterative and you're continually gathering feedback. And the key is that green arrow at the bottom, that this feedback is being put into the project design. So it's not just great prototype work, pilot work, you know, that's it. As you're scaling up, you're continuously tweaking and developing your product and solution, and you're continuously monitoring key parameters to ensure that it's still working as you scale up. Because, you know, obviously, look, as I say, scaling up is a huge program in itself that I cover, but different geographies, different landscapes, different demographics are going to react differently to your product. And if you are not continuously monitoring your scaling up process, you're going to miss this feedback. And for some people, as they're scaling up, they're going to realize this isn't working and therefore that feedback you may have to go straight back to one and straight back to the drawing board so continuously um, monitoring and doing it in stages um, a, a kind of bite sized stages so that you always have room to make those tweaks um, iteratively and redevelop your, your design your solution if necessary next slide please Alice Thank you. So uh, I have a, a tool that I use called the Assessing Scalability Tool. Often people have a great prototype um, or a solution and they're not quite sure when or, or, or how to uh, scale. <coughs> Sorry. And so this tool allows you to assess, look at a range of different categories and assess where you are um, whether you need to uh, focus on developing certain areas or whether you're ready to scale. And often uh, people really uh, like this tool because it gives them clear um, succinct kind of pointers on what they need to develop. So if we just move to the next slide, let's just hear what some of the participants say. These are new skills for me, uh, learning how to, how and why to scale up a product, a project or a product or a service. And finally, assessing scalability. This is what's key, it's new approach and Normally scale up is almost like a must. That is key because some things are going to work only on a local level, only as local products, only as local solutions programs. Others are going to scale and work successfully and you need to be able to learn and know the difference between the two. So that's the end of scaling up. So next slide please, Alice, so stop there. So I'm gonna pause here. That's really the uh, a whistle stop tour of the innovation program and the different steps and stages that I usually take. As I say, there's a range of tools and techniques that I have, but I've only obviously within the time limit, I've only been able to show you 
a few and it's usually based on kind of you know a, a, a few days a day to three days program so bear that in mind but if you do have any questions at this stage please let me know before i move on to some case studies to show you kind of what was, what are some of the innovations that i've used to develop Any questions coming in, Alice, or shall I move on? Um, no, no questions, right. Oh, one question. Um, okay. <laughs> this is from Pete. So he said, how do you manage the time spent on the organization of the project? What percentage of time would you suggest at each stage? Yeah, good question. So um, the brain, so as I say, my, this was a, a initial um, program that I developed for the UN and academics. And this is actually based on a three day intensive program some fit it into two days. So obviously, the this is the development research design stage, the prototyping, I would then say, give yourself six to eight weeks. The point is, you know, we're talking about rapid prototyping, we want to get quick ideas, quick feedback to understand where we are to understand if we're even on the right phase. So I would say, you know, the design phase can be very intensive, um, you know, two days really researching designing, as I say, um, that can be that can work quite quickly the teams just because you're working broadly that's about having a quality of rich dynamic and um, different people within your teams to help you really come up with great ideas and particularly if you're working on a subject area you'd have experts in your field and um, then the prototype in eight to six weeks and then the scaling obviously that's a long-term process so you know scaling could go on from you know a year to two to three years and that's an ongoing process i hope that answers your question please any other questions before I move on to the case studies? Um, no other questions. Pete says thank you. Great. So, um, as I say, bearing that in mind, that was the program that I used within the UN. And these are some of the case studies that I went on to develop um, within the intensive program. So next slide. Thank you, Alice. So UN Nepal. Nepal, at the time when I was there, had uh, an incidence of 47% and domestic violence within the country, which is obviously quite high. And they wanted to tackle this by addressing young people. So to start with that kind of mindset within the youth. So uh, what we did, or what, what, what I kind of led the team to do, was to develop a, a series of animations that reversed the gender stereotype. So usually, and not always, it's important to stress not always, but usually within domestic violence, the females are victims of domestic violence. As you can see in that picture, that is a man reporting the incidents of domestic violence, his experience, so the man is the victim, to a female police officer. They've never seen this before in Nepal. And it really seeks to change mindsets and, you know, shift in mindsets uh, in the end shifts behaviours. So you can see 86% of users said it made them think differently and 76 of the respondents said that it would change their behavior. It was a hugely successful campaign within the UN. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorites um, because one, it was very successful. Two, when UN China first came to me and said they've got this idea, I thought it was great. And um, other uh, teams around me didn't think it was so great, but um, it ended up being very successful. And you can see Ban Ki-moon in that picture celebrating the success of the project too. So UN China, they first started with a new stakeholder, which we talked about early on. So they started with Baidu, which is uh, Asia's equivalent of Google, so big tech giant. And they wanted to tackle the issue of electronic waste. China obviously has huge amounts of electronic waste. And um, they came up with an app that connects the end user with a local disposable unit. They would collect the electronic waste and it could be uh, safely uh, disposed of. They scaled to 22 cities in China and um, also has now scaled to Arab states. So a really, really popular um, innovation. And I think this is the final one. Next slide, please, Alice. So this is not one of mine within my programs, but often people think innovation has to be super hard, loads of tech, lots of money, high skilled resources. And this is still one of the most successful innovations that people talk about. UNICEF wanted a way to scale um, their um, medicine, their anti diarrhea kits, and get them to remote rural areas. And they want to, they needed to improve their distribution channels. Coca Cola has some of the biggest distribution channels in the world. They teamed up with Coca Cola. Coca Cola allowed UNICEF to put their medical kits into the crates and they improved their distribution almost overnight by 30 to 40%. Simple idea simple partner, costs very little, huge amount of social impact. 
So that really brings me to the end of the presentation. I think next slide, please, Alice. I think that's the quick questions. Yeah, Q&A. Um, I've given you a very quick tour of the steps that we take within the innovation process, why we would use an innovation process as opposed to traditional project cycles. And I've also given you some case studies and um, within uh, the kind of global arena that I've worked to show you how innovation can be successful. If you have any questions at this stage now or after, please don't hesitate to contact uh, Alice or myself and we'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you everyone for today. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, so Pete has just come back and said brilliant case studies examples. So thank you very much for that. Um, and as Tanya said, everybody, if anyone has any questions, then do feel free to pop them in the chat or raise your hand and I'll be able to um, be able to see if anybody's got any questions there. Um, Laura says very informative. Thank you. Um, Lucia said, really interesting. Thank you very much. So it seems as though everyone um, really appreciates what you've done for us today. So thank you very much, Tanya. Um, and as we've got, oh, we've got some questions coming through now. Um, <laughs> Pete has got a long question, it seems, because he's written that he's just typing it out. Um, <laughs> Pete, I think you win the prize for most engaged person today. Yeah, <laughs> or at least most, most vocal, I should say. <laughs> yeah, and, and Sophie as well for obviously getting those um, in the correct order. Absolutely. If we were yeah. in a workshop, Sophie, face to face, I could promise you we'd give you a prize. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's have a look. Um, oh, somebody's asked if we are recording. Yeah, the webinar is recording. We will be sending it out along with, as Tanya said, information on what we can do in a one to kind of three day program. So do keep an eye on your inbox for that. You'll probably get that um, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, so Sophie, our winner of today, she said, thank you so much, Tanya. I'd love to know how you got into this field. I'm currently on a graduate scheme in public health, but have no experience in policy as of yet. Yeah, I guess I, so I actually started in academia um, and I was tasked with developing an innovative kind of uh, special project. So I'd, you know, previously worked in education. And so I guess learned on the job there in terms of the innovation, just worked with a team of different scientists, you know, filmmakers, a range of different people. And also, as I say, lots of different um, organisations, from Mercedes Benz to the BBC. But then I moved to, I worked for Nesta, so the government's innovation agency. And then from my time at Nesta, I moved to the UN. Great, thank you, Tanya. And um, Aaron has said, um, very good presentation, practical um, application and great method. He said, for future presentations, please could he have a bit more or they get a bit more information on policy and guidance rather than simply good and bad practice? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, something that we can do. Do you have any, is it um, in, maybe a, a couple of minutes Tanya on how you can um kind of uh expand on that if there's something something else or do you have another case study there Not yeah I don't honest. have it <laughs> yeah so I guess Aaron so obviously we do include we do focus hugely on policy particularly in somebody something like the UN they're governed by you know policies of the various within the various countries in the various sectors so we certainly include that in the program I haven't focused on that today because you know that the key focus being innovation and sustainability but certainly in the wider program we do so I mean happy to kind of go through that um with you at a later stage absolutely and Aaron just so you know along with the recording and everything we will be sending out kind of an overview of what can be covered in the one to three days and I'm sure it goes into much more detail there. He said, Fab, thank you very much. So I'm sure Aaron, you will look forward to receiving that. <laughs> um, so Fraser has said there were nine social design approaches suggested. Do you consider all in order or are there approaches that you should focus on in particular? Well, I'm impressed by your memory first. Um, uh, <laughs> No, there isn't any order. That's really the brainstorming stage and, and what, you know, sometimes people, groups go through each and every one to see if they can produce a great idea, but that's not about the order, more about just trial and error with using and applying those different social design approaches. 
Great, thank you, Tanya. And uh, Sophie's just said, thanks so much, Tanya. It's really great to hear and has thoroughly enjoyed the session. Um, and we're getting a lot of feedback that people are saying that they've really enjoyed it. So that's that's really great. So thank you, Tanya. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, so Steve had said, is it possible to say a bit more about the approach to consultation? The approach to consultation. Can you say a bit more about that, Steve? Do you mean like the prototyping or...? Steve, if you're happy, oh, here we go. Um, engagement and prototyping. Yeah, so, I mean, so the approach, so as I say, often organisations have no approach and all of this is about, um, you know, fitting it in within your, your programmes, your timing, you know, what kind of teams you have. I guess the key thing, large organisations, even in the private sector, they find it very difficult to trial and test new ideas. So often what people do, um, alongside their kind of traditional programs, they'll put, they'll have an innovation hub or they'll develop an innovation team who have the space to try to make mistakes. That's the key thing around prototyping. When I uh, first delivered at the UN, they said failure is not a word in our vocabulary. Um, I introduced it, you know, so that that's what prototyping allows you to do. It's, it's very much starting at the beginning and saying, we do not know what this outcome will be. We, we, we'll come up with some ideas. Obviously, as I say, you should consult kind of experts research at the beginning so that you're at least you know having some sort of informed approach to the early stages solution just as they did with the miniature sleeping bag if you remember and um, but then you have to go out to your target audience and it's being prepared to fail you know you may go out with a product solution that who remembers virgin coca-cola it's not here anymore because they tried it richard branson tried it he put it on the shelves and it didn't sell because there were other versions of coca-cola that were better you know there's a range of products and services that reach our shelves all the time that fail and what we're trying to do is prototype test with it's about who you get involved as well so um you know in the program that i run i go through a step-by-step -step process of how you would start where you would prototype who you would prototype with the objectives so when you go to meet with your groups what are you actually testing for what are you asking them what are you trying to find out in terms of your solution and then that iterative process bringing that back and and reshaping your idea so i hope that gives you a little bit more uh, detail there no that's brilliant thank you very much tanya and yes it has so that's <laughs> that's good to read yeah <laughs> um, yeah i said great session thank you very much um, okay, well, I think that's all the questions that we have. But as I mentioned at the beginning, if anybody does think of any questions that um, afterwards or maybe in about an hour's time, you thought, oh, I should have asked Tanya that, then um, please do drop us a message and we will be able to, to answer them. Um, as I have said as well, this session is being recorded. So if there's anything that you wanted to catch up on, then you will be able to watch it again at your pleasure um, and pass it around to other people that you work with as well. We're really trying to um, kind of help and engage with our audience and our clients better at dogs. So um, yeah, we'll be more than happy for you to share this webinar. And um, lastly, let me just say thank you so much, Tanya, for joining us and taking some time out this morning to talk us through this. Um, I mean, I found it very, very interesting um, and I really hope that everyone else has as well. So um, yeah, so thank you all and um, have a lovely day and enjoy the sunshine. And um, you shall get an email in the next couple of days with some follow-up from us here at Dodds. But um, yeah, in the meantime, enjoy the sun and thank you. Everyone, thanks Alice, great to meet you all. Bye-bye.